I want to welcome everybody to this program using cover crops and home gardens. So I want to introduce our panel first. Of course, there's myself. I'm an extension educator for Ag and Natural Resources here in Boone County. Brenda Almer is a Boone County Advanced Master Gardener who has used cover crops in her home garden. And Joan Moore is a Boone County Silver Master Gardener who has also used uh, cover crops in her home garden. So we have a portion of the program for her. And Rosie Lerner volunteered to be co-host and also sort of the technology coordinator for this, which I very much appreciate. She's our Purdue Extension Consumer Horticulture Specialist. So I appreciate her being on this as well. If you see me, if you're watching my little thing with my picture. If you see me look to the right, that's because I actually am running the PowerPoint slides from a different screen than where my camera's on, because that way, when I look at my laptop, I can actually see what you're seeing, so if something goes off. So, but my PowerPoint slides are actually off to my right, so I will sometimes look over there. So as we go into the program, I want to give a little background on why I started doing this. I've been working with cover crops and agricultural systems for a long time, probably 15 years. In fact, uh, the Boone County Commissioners were gracious enough to give us about 10 acres just on the north side of the Boone County Fairgrounds in Lebanon. And we actually have mainly corn and soybeans. We have agricultural demonstration education plots and cover crops there. So we had that project started and we're putting together materials on the benefits of cover crops. And somewhere, I don't know, six, seven years ago, I thought, you know, the, the same benefits hold true for cover crops in a home garden as they do in an agricultural system. It's just a difference in scale. So why not put a program together on how to use cover crops in home gardens? So I set about doing that. So I've been doing this for, I don't know, six, seven years. Uh, Joan, I know, has helped me with this program in the past when we've done it. And this is obviously a different format, but I have uh, constricted a little bit of what I've done. Usually that's a longer program, but we will try to go through there. And I think it's important to note that this is just a really an introduction. Like any crop, and this is a crop, things will be more complex than we will portray here in, in a one hour program, but hopefully it'll be enough to kind of get you started, kind of get you some information. So the first thing we need to do when we start talking about cover crops is we have to define them and what are cover crops. So as this saying says, they are plants that we plant without believing we're gonna derive a direct economic benefit. We plant them primarily for their environmental benefits. Now, we're gonna talk about their benefits to our soils. And I think that's a secondary reason. They do benefit us as well with some of their impacts on the soils. But I think it's important to remember that we're not looking to actually harvest them and sell them or eat them or anything like that. But I also think we need to recognize the word crop. This is not just something we throw on the ground and forget about. We do actually have to manage them. They may be easier to manage than some things, but we still have to manage them. And that's why I think it's important to remember that they are a crop. So benefits of cover crops, I will go through these briefly, except I will spend a little time on soil health because I consider myself a soil health geek. <coughs> but they also uh, assist with erosion control, soil fertility. They increase the soil water holding capacity. They can help suppress weeds. They can help suppress diseases in plants. They can help su suppress insects. And they are certainly a factor in improving water quality. We have something in most forms of agriculture in the temperate zones, which of course Indiana is, called a brown gap. It basically in a typical setting, whether it's commercial field crops or your home garden, you plant things in the spring think, you know, crops grow during the summer and then you harvest them in the fall and then that garden just sits idle through the winter. I like to equate a garden as a factory and in this case your factory is producing vegetables for you. Why leave that factory completely idle and unimproved for six months? By using cover crops we can actually increase many of the th fertility improvements, biological activity for several months longer through the year than we can with just having garden crops. So we will talk a little bit about that, but there are ways of actually improving our soil by having cover crops, by extending the activity in that garden for a longer period of time. I love this image because I think it equates very much with what I am trying to portray. You know, even though there's nothing happening on top of the soil, there is a lot going on beneath the soil surface. We get beneath the frost line, there are all kinds of microbes and earthworms and grubs and insects going on. And one of the things we're gonna talk about is having a living root zone below the soil surface for as long as we can to help improve our soils. This is a very long statement and I will 
leave it to you to uh, hopefully in the in the PDF that I send you to read the entire thing through. But I think when we talk soil health, the key statement is that opening line, only living things can have health. Soil health is really a concept that is based on the idea that soil is alive and much of soil is. Again, we do have obviously a mineral component to soil, which is just the soil itself. Like if you put it in a microwave, we are finding out more and more about the impact of all of the microbes, the uh, earthworms, the bacteria, the fungi, the grubs, all of these things that live beneath the soil and their role in actually plant biology, nutrient cycling, and other aspects of soil health. So when we talk about soil health, what we're really talking about is the living community in the soil, insect, grubs, and earthworms, and microbial activities. I have actually an hour long presentation I give where I talk nothing but bugs in the soil. That's actually the topic. The title of the topic is bugs in the soil, how to improve the bugs in your soil, an extremely important component of crop production. So when we look at soils, we consider us to have three basic components of soil and that part of that's physical. So that's just the actual structure of the soil. That is um, what we can build a house on, what we can put a road on, those kinds of things. Then we have chemistry, and we talk about chemical properties, we talk about nutrients, we talk about the pH, we talk about some salts, those kinds of things that may be available for the plant. The one thing that we're just learning more about is the biological activity. And we have come to believe that about 90% of soil function is controlled by biological properties. So the more improvement we can make into these biological functions of the soil, the more productive our soil will be, the more uh, environmentally friendly it'll be. So these are all things we talk about when we get into soil health. Again, with soil health, we are talking about that living community beneath the soil. So what's the role of cover crops? It's maintaining that living root system below the soil surface. The vast majority of microbial life will live within a half inch to an inch of roots that are beneath the soil surface. That is their habitat. Every living root below the soil surface, we can consider to be a habitat zone for various forms of soil life. There are some exceptions, earthworms, grubs, some of those will move about a little bit differently. But when we talk about microbes in particular, they like to live in and around that root zone. I've got two figures in here I like. This is the first one. In the top six inches of soil, each acre of a healthy soil will contain between eight and 15 tons of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, earthworms, and arthropods. So there is a lot of microbial life in the soil. This is my favorite bug in the world called mycorrhizal fungi. If you look at this picture on the right, the vast majority of what is in this whitish picture on the right is not roots. That's not roots. That is fungi. And what the fungi do, they have a symbiotic relationship with plant roots. They attach themselves to the plant roots and they actually uh, derive some energy and carbohydrates from the roots. But in return, they provide the plant with a much larger surface area to absorb water and nutrients. And they also ha are heavily engaged in, in something we call nutrient cycling. The idea of nutrient cycling is this. If you go to you know, a store and you buy a bag of granular fertilizer, that fertilizer as it is in granular, granular form is completely worthless to your plant. It is useless. It is set to be inert and sit in a bag. In order for those nutrients to be broken down into a plant usable form, first thing we have to do obviously is apply it, then we have to apply water and then the uh, microbes have to attack it. And the microbes actually will convert those nutrients into a plant usable form. So the more of those microbes we have in the soil, the more vigorous we have what we call nutrient cycling and the more efficient we are in our nutrient use related to plant growth. I just wanna show an example of how much root growth you can get. This is from our cover crop plots just outside the fairgrounds. And this was taken in March of uh, some years ago, but it's a good picture, so I've, I've kept it in there. This is kind of to emphasize how much might be going on beneath the soil surface compared to what you see above the ground. This is cereal rye and it's only maybe three, four inches tall. This was preparation for a cover crops field day, but we have roots and it's hard to see. This is a fellow by the name of Mike Wigington from Natural Resources Conservation Service does this and he'll go down into soil pits and look for the roots. Um, you can kind of see one in the middle arrow if you look closely enough, if you have a good, large enough screen. But we have roots in that cereal rye down to three feet below the soil surface. 
And what those roots do, obviously we have microbes living there, they break through compaction layers, they provide porosity for water to pass through, water holding capacity, all these kinds of things. They also provide access to our cash crop to be able to send a root system down to maybe access water or nutrients when things are a little bit rougher. Okay, soil structure. This is kind of an undersung factor of microbes, but I think one of the things to talk about is that living beings, uh, for the most part, are gooey. We're gooey. We do all kinds of gooey stuff. I'm not going to go into details, but a lot of what people do is produce goo. If a, a uh, living being expires, they turn into goo. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, Beneath the soil surface, we have all these microbes, and they're doing what microbes do. They're doing socially distanced microbe partying. You know, they're all doing that, making new little microbes and dying. And they all exude these polysaccharides, and it behaves as, as soil glue, which is really has a tremendous impact on what we consider soil structure and stability. I am going to attempt to show a video. Ray Archuleta is a soil scientist from Illinois. And so what Ray's about to do is he's about he to take two samples of soil. And he, one of these is a soil that has been, it will be in the left tube. This is a soil that has been tilled year after year after year. And then he will place another sample of soil, same soil type, um, in the tube in the right. And that soil has been no tilled and had cover crops on it for an extended period of time. But what you want to do is when he places them in the water, look at the difference that the uh, two different clods of soil, how they behave. So you will see that the soil on the left immediately disintegrates. That is a soil that has been tilled. The reason it has no structure. Uh, every year that soil gets opened up to the elements and the microbes all die because they have grown up and lived and adapted to a closed environment. Whereas on the right, the soil there is not degrading at all because it has this structure. It has those polysaccharides. Now, if you left it in overnight, the soil on the right would eventually start to break apart, but it would break apart in larger chunks. But what we look for is that we really lose that soil structure. Um, that's just a, kind of an example of what happens when we break down those soil particles and we lose that soil structure. And if you think about it from a standpoint of erosion, every time a raindrop hits that soil on the left, it breaks that soil into very small particles. It does two things. Number one, part a good portion of it will actually drop down earthworm and root holes and it'll clog them. And I'll leave that soil with nowhere to go but to run across the surface of the soil. And again, those particles are very small, so they get picked up by the water. And it's pretty easy to have a, kind of a soil erosion problem based on that. So again, erosion control is usually the easiest thing I can sell to people because it's pretty simple, the concept. We have a living root system in the soil. So one of the benefits of cover crops is with that living root system in the soil, we prevent that kind of erosion, those roots holding. And they also buffer the soil from the impact of raindrops falling, falling on them from above. Soil fertility, how do cover crops help with that? Well, part of it's their green manure source. Uh, when we get done with a garden, we have some fertilizer left in the garden, or we should. We should have some extra because we always have to have a little bit of a buffer because you don't know how the weather might impact that fertilizer use. Normally, particularly for things like nitrogen and sulfur, those sources of fertilizer will just be lost. They will be washed up in the water. They'll be volatilized off in the atmosphere. By planting cover crops, those co cover crops will actually use that for fertilizer to actually grow their own structure and keep it in the field or in the garden. And then later on, they become a green manure source because they terminate the cover crop and can actually put them into the ground and they can serve as fertilizer. The root system, as well as the microbes, will add to our organic matter. Again, we've talked about the nutrient cycling that comes about because of the microbial activity and also the root systems themselves of the plants will have both nutrients in them and will provide increased access for other crops to access water, for example, in a dry year. Soil water holding capacity, again, by having cover crops, we increase that because those root channels, once we terminate the cover crop, they provide a place for water to go. They allow it to hold. Again, we have more structure, so we have better tilth. So again, we can really improve our water holding capacity. We've also increased the numbers of different microbes and insects that are in the soil. They also produce pores. So these whole things will really increase our water holding capacity in the soil. I always throw this up here because when we talk about climate change, I think people sometimes don't realize how much carbon you can store in the soil and soil organic matter. And just to throw the quote out there, each 1% of soil organic matter in, will contain about 10 tons of carbon per acre in the top foot of soil. 
Now, way back when, before Europeans came to this area, again, in, in Indiana, we were mostly eastern hardwood forest. And our soil organic matter was probably more in the 4 to 6 percent range, where today a lot of them are in the 2 to 3 percent. If you happen to be from an area that was native prairie, it was probably more in the 6 to 8 percent. We're probably not going to be able to get to that level with the kind of monoculture annual crops that we tend to grow, but we can get higher than we are. And if we can add soil organic matter, we can take a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. And again, cover crops will do that. They will add organic matter. Weed suppression is fairly simple. If we plant cover crops, they outcompete the weeds. They're competing for the same resources, the, the nutrients, the sunlight, the water. Some roots of cover crops have what's called an allelopathic effect, they actually uh, secrete chemicals that will restrict the growth of some other weeds. Uh, you don't want to count on it for too much, but particularly our, our brassicas like oilseed radish can do that. One of the things they also do is change soil biology where the microbes that are associated with our soil are the ones that favor the cover crops and not the weeds. So again, the weeds do not have as much of an advantage as they would um, if we didn't have cover crops. This is a picture I took from our field day. And what you're seeing here is on the top, we always, we plant 40 foot wide strips for the length of the field in this field situation with different varieties of cover crops. And for this top strip above the red line, that it was our control strip with no cover crop. It was just a straight no-till stretch. The bottom one had oats and our what we call tillage radish or oilseed radish. Oats and oilseed radish winter kill. This picture was taken in March. There is no oats or oilseed radish there, but there's also no purple dead nettle. If you've ever driven Indiana fields and in the spring you see a field of purple, it's either purple dead nettle or henbit. It's one or the other. And the reason that's important is purple dead nettle actually is an overwintering host for something called soybean cyst nematode, which is a serious and, and pretty can be financially devastating pest of soybeans. So just by having the oats and tillage radish out competing the purple dead nettle, which is a winter annual, out competing the winter dead nettle in the fall, it did not establish itself and come up, even though there's no cover crop growth in the spring. I was very surprised to see that. So if people, you know, when people talk about weed suppression, it's there. Insect suppression, one of the things we're doing here is we are interrupting the insect life cycle. We may be providing a habitat for some enemies of some of our insect pests. So they may provide some of our cover crops are pollinators. So that's great. I do want to note that there are cover crops that can harbor insects that can cross over to our vegetable crops. We'll talk more about that a little bit when we get into termination, but it's one of the reasons why we advise people they may want to terminate their cover crop two to three weeks before they plant so that those insects, rather than jumping to your garden, will actually starve or move on to somewhere else before you plant your garden. Water quality, again, we've reduced soil erosion, so we've reduced sedimentation. Many nutrients are carried by soil particles. If I see a problem with phosphorus level in a stream, I I mean, I could, we could have a permitted release by a, a municipal system, or we could have non-sewer or non-compliant rural septics. But a lot of times we see that, and I think of erosion, because phosphorus bonds very tightly to soil particles. And quite often, if we see high phosphorus level, we know it's because of sedimentation and erosion. So by having cover crops, we reduce surface runoff, uh, water stays in the garden, uh, nutrients stay in the garden, pesticides stay in the garden. Same thing with leaching, the water stays in the soil, it doesn't just shoot through, it, it gets taken up by the roots of our cover crop. Again, we talked about green manures, but I do think these numbers are important. I've done research in commercial ag and found that when planting a cover crop after corn or soybeans, cover crops can reduce the level of nutrients reaching water by up to 50%. They do the same thing in pesticides because all those microbes, uh, their activity actually helps break down pesticides. Also the living root system of the cover crops will also take, take them up and out of the environment. And they found that they can also reduce the level of pesticides reaching water by up to 50%. Very quickly, types of cover crops. We have three main types, legumes, broadleaves, and grasses. I'll go through them very quickly. Those of you who garden know that legumes are involved in nitrogen fixation, right? They take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and can add quite a bit of soil fertility. The one problem we have in Indiana, as compared to farther south, is that often if we plant our legumes in the fall, we do not have a long enough growing season to get, derive the full benefit. It takes about four to six weeks for a legume to go from being a nitrogen user to get started to become a nitrogen producer. And sometimes that growing season is not long enough here. Sometimes it is. But if you 
idle part of your garden earlier, maybe you could plant that to legumes and use that area to actually fix some nitrogen into your system. This is another picture that was taken actually on March 31st, and this is clover in our, in our crop fields, and we already have nodulation going on with the clover in that field. Now, it's not yellow. Once it turns yellow is when it really begins fixing nitrogen, but that uh, bacterial activity to form nodules is already starting. So this clover is going to be, again, from March 31st, this clover is going to be fixing nitrogen in the fairly near future for us. Broadleaves are the not, you know, they're non-legume broadleaves. They are nitrogen scavengers. If we have extra nitrogen in our fields, they use them. A lot of them have a great root system for breaking up compaction. Down in the lower right, you see the picture of the oilseed radish. A lot of people get excited about the big tuber. But one of the huge benefits is this massive thread root that oilseed radish produce. They can produce six, eight foot long thread root. And that thread root will break through compaction layers. Um, it will go right through a fragile pan right through it. Also the brassicas, the canolas, and, and some of our rapeseed can suppress some pests, particularly weeds. We do want to avoid allowing them to go to seed. The uh, upper right hand picture is buckwheat. It will reseed, but it's a great pollinator attractor too. It, it's good pollinator food. So, but they are good soil builders and they, and some of them really break up compaction well. Grasses, again, we're probably pretty familiar with get grasses. They like nitrogen. They usually have a good root zone. Some of them we have to be a little bit careful about, but and some of them will grow very nicely in the spring. Oats is one of our favorites for new cover croppers because it does winter kill. Mixes have more benefits. This is one of Brenda's pictures that I think she's going to be showing later, but sometimes they require a little more, a little more management. But we do think that oil, oats and our oil seed or tillage radish makes a very nice starter cover crop mix because it does winter kill, typically. Uh, establishing cover crops, there's more details in the PowerPoint. I, this is one of the parts I shortened for time. But outside of the fertility, because we don't usually apply starter fertilizer, um, there are a lot of similarities with planting lawns and turf. For most of them, but there's a few exceptions, most of them we want to get them in the ground by September 15th. As with planting everything. Good seed to soil contact is essential. We want to water them lightly and frequently at first to help them get established. Weeds, again, any newly seeded crop cannot compete with an established weed. And if they're a smaller seed, a light mulch of straw or something similar can be helpful. Termination. This is the area that often gets people in trouble. And I tell people quite often, when you start selecting your cover crop, maybe your first question should be, how do I want to terminate it? If you say, I am not going to chemically terminate it, there are cover crops you should not use. There are cover crops where chemical termination is really the only reasonable answer. So again, for first timers, species that winter kill is a great option, but some clovers, you know, our oats and oilseed radish usually winter kill. Oilseed radish, is hardy to 10 above, I believe. We've got some clovers that will sometimes uh, winter kill. Again, some of them get down to zero. So you need to have a backup plan in case of warm winter. I threw these two pictures in. This is from our cover crop plots. There was a year, I think it was 2015 through 16 winter. Lowest temperature recorded in Whitestown was 19 degrees. This is the previous years, previous falls planted oilseed radish in our cover crop plots. We lost about five bushels per acre yield in those two strips because the tillage radish or the old seed radish came back. So you have to be aware of that. It's unusual. It hasn't happened since, but that one year it was extremely warm and it actually did not terminate. Some species you can do mechanical termination. You need to make sure that it has gone through its full life cycle before you do that. But once it has seeded out, if it's a winter annual, once it has gone to seed, you can mechanically terminate it. We do advise in most cases uh, terminating a couple of weeks before you plant your garden. You don't get that migration of insects I mentioned. If there are allelopathics effects, which some, there's some evidence that cereal rye and maybe your oilseed radish have, uh, that reduces those. Carbon to nitrogen ratio is a big deal with plant growth. And if we have a large carbon producing cover crop and we terminate it, we try to immediately plant a crop such as sweet corn that really needs nitrogen or even tomatoes or some of those, we can have a problem because what happens is the carbon is like the energy drink for the, 
for the microbes and they will gobble it up and then they will steal nitrogen to make amino acids to create their own physical structure. So when you get very high carbon nitrogen ratios above about 25 or 30 to one, you can get a problem with that. Cereal rye, for example, has an 82 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. So we have to be careful about that. So that's one reason why terminating ahead of time is sometimes a good idea get some of that decomposition. Some cautions, again, term, know how to terminate before you plant. I think I've gone through most of this. Herbicide carryover is not usually a huge home garden problem, but if you are a preen user, Treflan, and you do a late application, you could, that could have some carryover where it's still left in the ground when you try to plant your cover crops. Den dense root systems are tough. I'm going to show a picture of annual ryegrass a little bit later. I already went through the second bullet point and the third one, and I'm running late. I do want to point out annual ryegrass. I have had several people who somebody had told them how great annual ryegrass was as a cover crop. And it is if you have the right system. But you should not plant annual ryegrass in a home garden setting unless you have a tractor with a tillage implement. It will clog a rotor tiller. You go two feet in that garden, it will clog your rotor tiller and you have to clear it. And then you go another two feet, it will clog your rotor tiller. I've had people swear off cover crops for life because their first experience was with annual ryegrass. And, and it also produces seed prodigiously. It comes up, it's almost like crabgrass. It just comes up and produces seeds. Even though it's an annual, it produces a lot of seeds. So you can be left with a weed problem. So I advise people really to stay away from annual ryegrass. It's a, it's a great root system, great soil builder. People in commercial ag systems sometimes use it and, and get along fine if they're familiar with it. But I, for home gardens, I just think it's one to stay away from. Very quickly, I want to talk, and this is Boone County, Indiana, around Lebanon, where we have some cover crop sources. I do want to mention that Walmart on their website mentions that they carry cover crop seed. You can order it from Amazon. I do advise people to check the label. We've had problems with poor quality seed coming into Indiana that has not been certified. They should go through the Indiana State Seed Commissioner for certification to be sold in Indiana because you can get some weed seeds or some maybe not even what you think you're getting with this. But Byron Seeds is one source. We have a couple of local distributors and they have a mix specifically for cover crops that is available. And this is New Ross grain, which you'd have to be familiar with this area, but New Ross is kind of at the southwestern corner of Boone and northwestern corner of Hendricks County. And they've actually developed a home garden cover crop, crop, cover crop mix uh, that, that they sell for gardens. So uh, those are two options, but you know, look, look it up in your local area, see what's available. And you, uh, you go to a co-op, they're going to want to sell you a large quantity of it. But if you go to your local garden center, they may have it available. And again, it, uh, you know, it, it's just interesting. It started to kind of take off and, and there are people who are interested in that. Now we're going to turn things over to Brenda Elmer. I've been gardening for about 30 years, and I would have to say that those 30 years have been an experiment each year. Nothing turns out quite the same. But I started experimenting with cover crops about seven years ago, and the first cover crop I decided to plant was a rye. Um, it ended up I had this whole imagination that it would winter kill, and in the spring I would be able to go out and kill it up and plant my garden. Well, that was a big mistake. I went out in the spring and I had a full green patch of rye. I thought I'd kill it, but my tiller would not go through it, like Kurt said. And so I ended up putting black plastic all over my garden, laying it down with rock and firewood and anything else I could find. And about two or three weeks later, I was able to go through and kill it. But since then, I have decided that there has to be a better cover crop. And I ran a crop, a garden cover crop that Brian Seeds here in Indiana actually produces. And the picture on your left of the screen is that mix that I use. And I covered my whole garden with that. And you can see it's very flush, it's very um, well grown. I don't know that I planted the whole bag, I don't remember, but it seems to be very thick. And I really did that a lot of difference. Um, on the right hand side of this picture, you'll see the different um, different uh, seeds that are in it. There's an oats, which is a grass looking um, picture, and it actually helps suppress the weeds. And then there's a nitro radish, um, and then a crimson clover. The nitro radish is 
into the bigger green leaf, and it actually um, will help break the soil. Okay, and the radish, the nitro radish, is on your left. You can see that it's quite long and quite has quite a diameter around it, and it actually helps break up the soil. And you can kind of see on the right-hand side of the picture that it actually is breaking up the soil the way it's growing and pushing up. But it is quite lengthy. I can't remember when I actually took that picture. It's probably October. So it went ahead and continued growing, I'm sure, at that point. Um, I have planted the crimson clover, um, like I said, with that. Um, it does bloom in a little pretty red bloom. And it actually wants to put an back into the soil. I planted this same cover crop probably four times out of the last six years. And I definitely have um, experienced an improved soil, being we are in Indiana with the clay soil. So um, it seems like the soil is more rich, rich and more loose, that type of thing. Um, there's less weeds in my garden, and I'll kind of talk about that, how I rotate my crops uh, later. But I've also noticed that there's um, more worms in my soil than I've seen before, but there's less bad bugs and less insects that I usually try and get rid of, but that might be the way I've been planting my garden lately, which I'll talk about next. Um, the last couple of years, I have started to think along the lines of rotating my crops versus doing my whole garden into the uh, cover crop. So what I started last year was I started uh, thinking about dividing my garden into thirds on a little bit smaller scale than half, I guess. So what I did last year was I planted one third of my garden into vegetables. And then I actually tilled the other two thirds, like every two to three weeks, just to keep the weeds down and not let them seed out with the intention of planting a, a cover crop. And what I did with the vegetable crop, um, I, I'm not one to pull weeds. So what I did was I put down landscaping paper and topped it with straw so I wouldn't be pulling weeds all summer in my vegetable garden. It seemed to work wonderful. Um, and so I continued that process. And then last fall, I cleared out my vegetable garden and I just let everything sit all winter long. And I did not get the cover plant, uh, cover crop planted. So I went out this spring and I decided that I would go ahead and start planting. I ended up deciding to just plant the other one, just another one third of my my garden into the vegetables, leaving the one that I planted last year vacant and just left it the way it was with the landscape paper and the straw. And then I continued tilling the one third of my section that had had nothing on it. Um, then I decided this year I would go ahead and get the cover crop planted. So what I did was I did the, the part that I planted to vegetables last, last year, I actually just rolled up the landscape paper and the straw, and it was still wet and moist underneath. So then I took a rake, and I just raked it very lightly, and I hand-sewed the cover crop seed uh, in that area. I took the old straw and just sprinkled it on top without raking it, the seed in, and then I watered it in. And it, it's coming up beautifully. I did this like two weeks ago. So it's coming up very well. And then I went ahead and I um, did the part that I tilled all year this year, tilled it up about an inch. And then I did the same thing using a grass spreader and then put straw on top without raking and then watered it in. But once again, it's coming up wonderfully. So I'm very happy with those two plots. But then I decided I have a perennial patch, which consists of my asparagus, my rhubarb, and my strawberries that I usually just put an organic fertilizer on. But I decided, okay, what if I just put this cover crop seed in there? I wonder what would happen. So I sprinkled it in there on all three patches. Uh, the asparagus actually had a hardwood mulch on it that I actually put on this spring. And then the rhubarb and the strawberries had either leaves or straw on them. And when I sprinkled them on, I just watered it in. And there again, the three different seeds have come up. So I have basically my whole garden into a cover crop this year. So I'm very happy with the combination that I've been using. And my hope next year is to plant half vegetables and half 
um, maybe cover crop in the fall again because I really don't need the huge garden I have right now. So I'm trying to cut back without eliminating, I guess. So with that, I'd like to turn it back to Kurt. I don't believe Joan has any slides, so I'll leave Brenda's last slide up. Yeah, we will turn things over to Joan Moore, who is another master gardener here in Boone County. Well, I've gardened for a long time, and um, I was glad to discover the cover crops, and I've used those for several years. Uh, I've used cereal rye and the radish and the clover in the fall. And then one year, I also used buckwheat in the spring. Um, and buckwheat attracted so many bees that I really hated to cut it down. And I realized I was going to have a problem if I didn't. And um, I did have a few seed that seeded down, but it really wasn't a, uh, too much of a problem. And I'll probably use that again this spring, next spring. Um, I don't like dealing with weeds, so I really like the, that the cover crops suppress the weeds and, and it's improving the soil. And uh, I know it's important to, uh, to uh, for the time that you plant it, because last year I planted mine too late and then we had an early freeze and uh, mine didn't do very well last year. So I'm gonna try to stay on top of that this year. Um, and like Brenda, I also like to mulch and I use newspaper and straw for several years. Uh, this year, mostly I just use straw and I think that's really a good way to uh, suppress the weeds also. Um, that's all I have, I'll turn it back to Kurt. I think we'll combination of me and Rosie because I think we are into question and answer time. Yeah, so um, looking at the questions, uh, there was a question earlier about hairy vetch, is that considered invasive? You were talking about the yeah. Uh, it's the not legumes. invasive per se. It can be weedy. Um, I'm trying to get my. It can be weedy. I think that's uh, one that um, perhaps the root system gets pretty uh, tangly for trying to turn it under. Is that right? Uh, I haven't seen that as that big a problem. I haven't okay. heard of that. Um, what happens is it's really a prodigious seed producer. Um, okay. so it, it likes to produce seeds. So it's another one of those. I always advise people, if you have a flowering cover crop, um, it's great to have the flowers because that attracts your pollinators. And of course, for the case of vetch, it's a legume. So you want to let that nitrogen thing, you know, the fixation be going, but you really want to probably only allow it to be in bloom for about a week before the seeds turn hard and become fertile and make new little hairy vetches at the point in time, uh, you know, when you're, when you're establishing them so okay uh let's see there was another question about planting date so you had mentioned september 15th for boone county central indiana what do you think about northern indiana they were specifically asking about elkhart county but i'm okay, sure others have that pretty, question it'd be pretty similar um yeah it's not maybe a little right. later for southern indiana yeah yeah you get farther south obviously you can go a little later um so uh, i think it's uh kind of a one of those us 40 things in indiana <laughs> really you kind of split the state in half sure. and you go south of that and uh, it's kind of one of those things and the other thing elkhart county has is uh just a tickle not a lot like farther west but tickle of modification in uh, weather due to uh, lake michigan so. sure and as uh john was mentioning we had a really early uh kill uh last fall which was right. rather unusual for for us um even north of 40 that was a little bit unusual so um there was another question about uh let's see what about adding and tilling in chopped leaves into the garden will that also help soil health <laughs> you, you don't need me to answer that one anytime you add <laughs> organic matter it's a good thing make sure they're well chopped i mean if you do whole leaves they don't decompose the way you want you have to remember they're a brown so they're carbon they're not giving you nitrogen and you have to i would say uh uh, even though it's more an issue with the juggalone and the root system, I would be careful about things like walnut leaves and some of those kinds of things. So you have to know what you're putting in there. But yeah, well, you know, obviously, anytime you add organic matter, it's a good thing. Almost. I suppose okay. probably some exceptions because there's an exception to everything. Somebody was wanting to know how large your gardens are. And I think that question is for both Brenda and Joan. How big are your gardens? You'll have to my unmute garden, your microphones. Yeah, my garden is about 30, 53 feet by 35 feet, which is far more than what I need now that my kids are gone. So that's the yeah. reason I'm considering rotating crops a little bit. Yeah. I'm not sure. I think mine's about 40 feet square. Okay. 
So you're good. both pretty good size. That's 1,500, yeah. 1,600 square feet, which is... It's a lot of space. Yeah, that's pretty good size. Good. Okay. Do you recommend cover crops and raised beds? Uh, sure. Uh, yes. Uh, I, you know, it's a different system. I mean, you're controlling the erosion. You're controlling some things. You have more control over a lot of things. Uh, it still will increase your nutrient cycling. It will still increase your microbial activity in the soil because you have that habitat. I don't think you'll see uh, the kind of benefit you will in a more uh, traditional type of a garden. But I mean, there's, there are certainly benefits to be had. And again, you, you will probably have excess nutrients, in a, you know, fertilizer in that garden and, you know, put them into cover crops and then put them in as a green manure the next spring. So I, I think it, have, well, sorry, I, go ahead. I do have raised beds. That's what my garden is. And I, and I, I find it, it works fine. Do you have sides um, supporting your raised yeah. beds? Good okay. Sides, yes. Yeah, I think uh, for some people who just have mounted raised beds with no uh, side supports, then uh, cover crops could be really, really helpful. Oh yeah, particularly case, on the erosion. Actually, yeah. yeah, you're keeping your mounds in place. So yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, but 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 you're right. It's great for building soil health in general. So can't ever overdo that. Let's see. Uh, can you use cover crops anywhere in a suburban landscape to improve the soil? And I think we we probably just answered that, but they also wondered about uh, if they competed well against the thistles. Uh, well, uh, they will on new thistles coming in. I mean, if you've got a perennial thistle that, if we're talking Canada thistles, which is probably what you're talking about, um, you know, they come in all the time and sometimes they come in on mulch. Yes, they compete with them, um, I believe that the uh, oilseed radish actually has some allelopathic uh, effect against them a little bit. Mm. Um, but if you've got a perennial thistle in there, it's not going to do much for that. That thistle's established and everything. But um, obviously it's competition for the nutrients and water and it will help. But I wouldn't consider it to be a, a full-on uh, cure. Uh, I don't think, uh, don't think uh, we can say that. I will say to the question about anywhere in an urban landscape setting, uh, as with wildflower patches or rain gardens or those kinds of things, depending on your setting, you may need to educate your neighbors that you are not just letting your garden be weedy. So there True. may be some education you might need to uh, uh, take take place to make sure your neighbors know that. Yeah, hey, I, want I want my garden to be green as much as I uh, yeah. can. I like green better than brown uh, to, uh, to educate them. Yeah, and I suppose there could be some uh, HOA uh, covenants about certain plantings and plant height and all that kind of stuff, depending on where you live. But that um, is possible. Was, yeah. was the radish that Brenda showed the oilseed radish? I would guess yes. Yes. <laughs> How late is too late in the season to plant cover crops? And that will really depend on the weather, won't it? It'll depend on the weather, it'll garden. depend on the cover crop. Yeah, uh, you that's can plant true. cereal rye until after Thanksgiving. Okay. Uh, cereal rye only needs a 34 degree soil temperature to germinate. It's sort of like uh, cereal rye is the one for farmers. So, you know, it's a, it's a little tough when they're uh, growing corn the next year, but cereal rye is sort of the crop with farmers. If they really want to plant a cover crop, you can't uh, find somebody to fly it on their fields or whatever. They, they're late. Um, cereal rye and wheat, wheat will do the same, but cereal rye is better as a cover crop um, is kind of your rescue. Uh, there is a, we did not um, talk about it here. It's really more for agricultural purposes. There is something called the Midwest Cover Crops Council, which has a cover crop selector tool. And if you Googled that, um, you would find it and you can find uh, one of the things that we'll do if you select all crops and your location, it will tell you the uh, generally accepted planting date for your, for whatever all the cover crops. But most of them want to be in the ground by September 15th. Cereal rye is definitely an exception, though. Um, what was the name of that again, Kurt? I will go get the link and put it in the, the chat. Midwest Cover Crop Council. MWCC, probably MWCC.org. And it's a calculator? Yeah, the there's decision. a cover crop selection tool. tool. Got it. The, uh, okay. Yeah. I got it. I'm going to put it in the chat here. Yeah. I mean, it, it, most, most of what's in there is, is for commercial agriculture, but it will sure. tell you the, the planting dates are the same for you, really. If you do a winter kill type cover crop, what do you do with it in the spring to avoid messing with the soil too much? 
Well, I guess I'm not 100% sure. I I'm meaning, turn that I, I over presume. To Joan or Brenda, but it will decompose in place. I mean, if you want to till it in, you can till it in. Uh, or you could do no till and let right. it stand. But and you would no. certainly want to uh, um, uh, w probably postpone your planting a little bit until About it two has weeks, a chance. two to three yeah. weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I would say uh, somebody I thought I saw in the chat, they want to avoid tilling. Um, yeah, pretty much if it's winter killed, yeah. it's going to lay there. Um, and yeah. you basically make your row and you just uh, kind of push the cover crop as it's laying there to the side. And it makes a nice mulch. Cereal rye right. as a mulch is something farmers are discovering. Um, they plant they plant their soybeans in it and they go in about two, three weeks later and they crimp the cereal rye right over the soybeans and the soybeans love it because uh, all of a sudden they've got soybeans planted with a mulch. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, as a, it works as a mulch, you just have to make your uh, seed slots kind of through it a little bit. Okay. Any other questions? Getting close to the end of our time here. Good. I'll editorialize a little bit because we talk about no-till sometimes. And uh, I'm trying to remember, Joan, do you no-till? No, I use late till. Okay. Uh, one of the things, no-till gets a bad rap um, from weed control. And initially, that is actually true. Uh, I want to talk about the concept of something called a seed bank. Anytime you have weeds and they drop seeds, those seeds are stored in the soil. And some of our weeds can be there, um, can survive for up to 10 years. What happens with no-till is the first couple of years, the seeds that are near the soil surface will germinate and we have to control them. But we are not stirring up that deeper seed bank to the sunlight where that will germinate. If we do tillage, um, what we do is we terminate the current weeds, but we bring other weed seeds up to the surface. So a lot of people find with no-till, after two to three years, they find their weed pressure really is reduced um, because that seed bed um, those seeds that are six inches or eight inches below the soil surface never get to the surface and uh, they just kind of go away. So no-till, if we, uh, since somebody did bring up no-till in a garden situation, can work. You just have to be a little patient with it because it takes two, three years a lot of times to pay off. What cover crops are recommended for perennials such as asparagus, rhubarb, and strawberries? Yeah, I wouldn't you, I don't know as I'd use any. I'd let your perennials, since they're a perennial, uh, kind of do their thing. Um, I, think I think maybe a mulch think, might be good for yeah. weed suppression. Yeah, I mean, I think I would just use a mulch. I wouldn't put a, I think your cover crop, you know, you've got all that microbial life because they're a perennial, their root system's already kind of trucking. And uh, if you put a cover crop down, it's going to compete with them. So I'm not sure exactly. I would do that. I will yeah. say that um, we did not talk about interseeding. Some people try interseeding and some people have pretty good luck with it. And they do things like white clover, which is a legume, and will fix nitrogen. And what they do, because it low, grows low, they will make sure that their rows are wide enough they can take their lawnmower down it and keep it fairly short. Um, but it makes a nice bed in between the crop, and it will fix nitrogen. And they can use interseeding with cover crops. And it, it will suppress the weeds between the rows. But you will need wider rows um, to be able to control it a little bit. So. And, and did, Brenda, did you mention that you use uh, cover crops with your perennial crops? I experimented I know this year. I did throw some seed in there just to see what it's going to do. Uh, because <laughs> okay. I use an organic fertilizer. I just do not have to do that. So I was just going to experiment. Yeah. And, and that's the other issue is establishing the cover crops. Your perennials are already up there. They're already you know, competing for the nutrients, all those kinds of things. I'm not sure establishment would go real well in a perennial bed. Um, it might. I mean, there's certain things. I mean, obviously, we know some weeds can get going in a perennial bed. but Yeah. I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> we might have to do an update next year. Yeah, we, yeah. All right. I think we're out of time here. And uh, we had a few people that just joined at the very last minute. I don't know if uh, maybe they got a time zone confusion, perhaps. Um, but this program is being recorded and Kurt will send out a link to the recording in his follow-up email. Yes. Yeah, so if you received a uh, email about 3 or 3.30 in the afternoon, Indiana time or Eastern time, uh, from me, you will also, and, and even if somebody signed up a little later, I will be 